I uh, thank you, Richard. Appreciate uh, appreciate your comments and thoughts uh, that help us frame uh, our thinking around this event. Um, it, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Taryn Hyatt, who is going to offer a personal perspective uh, that can help frame this um, uh, this event in the next two days in our discussion. Uh, and Taryn is from the American uh, Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So, Taryn, let's welcome you. Well, it truly is an honor to be with you this morning, and I am I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some some thoughts that I have, um, having been in this work for going on 16 years. I always tell people, you know, when I was a little kid, I did not envision that I would grow up and become a suicide prevention advocate. That was not on my list of things to do. Um, this was a cause that that chose me very personally. Um, on October 5th of 2002. I lost my father, Terry Aiken, to suicide. Um, my dad is someone who lived with serious mental illness, um, untreated for most of his life because of the incredible stigma that surrounds mental illness and, and his own personal guilt and shame for having an illness that he thought was somehow his fault. Um, as I watched my dad growing up, you know, it was no mystery to us that he was ill. We just didn't understand the levity of what we were really dealing with. Um, his depression manifested itself so physically that he ended up having over 22 surgeries over the course of his life to treat the, the esophagus from having erosion due to acid reflux and things that, that we know. We know that mental health can manifest physically in our bodies and, and that those, those surgeries left him with another illness. Um, addicted to, to opioid medications. In the, in the weeks leading up to my father's suicide, he was taking 30 Ambien a day. I did say 30. In addition to the Oxycontin, the Neurontin, the Gabapentin. You know, his, his, his depression was, was always treated with, with medication. Some prescribed and some that he probably shouldn't have been. He never got the, the other side, the, the behavioral treatment. The, the information about the illness to better understand what it was he was grappling with, nor did we as his family. You know, when I think about suicide, I, I personally know too because I'd had my own attempts as a teenager. I, I understand what it's like to live in that dark night of the soul we hear it referred to as. And, and I remember after his death, you know, the conversations that, that came in our family were, were ones that were very shame filled. You know, what do we tell people? I remember my aunt even saying, you know, should we say he had a heart attack? And, and I just remember saying, no. <laughs> I won't share the word I really said. But no, we're, we're done doing this. We are done being quiet. As his family, what we needed was the same education that we offer to other health issues. If my father had been living with cancer, diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, we would have had information given to us and provided to us. We would have had care as his caregivers. We would have known how to support him in a way that encouraged him to get the help that he so desperately needed. But we didn't have access to that. You know, as I've done this work for the last 16 years and families reach out to me and ask, where can I go? Who do I send my loved one to? Thank God we have NAMI. Thank goodness we have these, these places. But we need more. If you think of the the toll that it takes on somebody living with a person with serious mental illness and, and the behavior that the person is engaging in that we take so personally because we don't have that understanding, we, we need to do better. Um, I love the, the movement that is taking place in our nation where we are finally addressing suicide as a health issue. But again, if we're going to treat it as the health issue it is, we need to do it on all aspects. There is no shame in getting help for it. There is no shame in, in admitting that that's what I'm thinking, but understanding that people don't commit suicide. If it's a health issue, they do not commit it. They die from it. Suicidal behavior is an attempt to cope, as all behavior is. And, and for a person in that moment of, of intense pain and crisis, they have a belief system that is altered and is different. Um, I'm going to share a quick little analogy that I, I share often and actually, I find it very poignant that it happens to be today. 9-11 of 2001, our country witnessed one of the most horrific events we will ever see. But we also witnessed a powerful lesson if we would have learned it. 
You'll remember much like I did, watching the towers be hit. They began to burn. And what did we see the people at the tops of the towers start to do? They jumped. They jumped. By definition, they, they took their own life. They died of suicide. Yet none of us sat on our couch and said, oh my gosh, you coward. How selfish of you. How could you do that to your friends and family? Did they jump because they wanted to die? No. They jumped because they were desperate to escape unbearable pain and anguish. They jumped because their thinking was anything but rational in that moment, and their crisis point had been reached. If we can look at individuals who are thinking of suicide with that same compassion and understand that that is their same experience, that in that moment, whatever is happening, whether it's the mental illness, the life experience, the, the trauma, the, the thing that has them to that crisis point that says, I can't do it one more minute. They're desperate to get away from that. In every attempt I had as a teen, it was not that I wanted to die. I just didn't know how to live with what was happening to me, and I wanted to get away from it. It was almost that fight or flight response that kicked in that said, help, help to stop. I actually want to live and survive. And thank God I've gone on to live a full and meaningful life. You know, I say this all the time, too. Had I died all those times I tried, I wouldn't be experiencing the life I am today. And there is hope in that. There is hope for recovery, and that's the message we need to continue to get out there. Suicide can be prevented. It is not 100% preventable. That can't be our message either. Until everyone in our communities knows the warning signs for suicide the same way we do for heart attack and stroke, until we are all capable and willing to, to administer that care that folks need in those moments of immediate crisis, we're not gonna get ahead of this. I am so thankful for the zero suicide movement. I live in the state of Utah. We have been part of this initiative since its inception, and yet we've got a long way to go. But my dad is one of those who would have benefited from the electronic health records being shared the emergency room doctor that he saw on the day of his suicide who prescribed him the medication, had they seen a record from another hospital would have known, one, he'd had a previous attempt, two, that he was getting multiple medications from multiple doctors. It would have been an opportunity just to say, wait a sec, let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about your pain. Tell me why you're here today, not just given the medication that he used to end his own life. When we look at the compassion, I've shared this before, that we, we treat individuals with other health issues, if we can apply that same compassion to folks living with serious mental illness and suicidal thoughts and behaviors, we make a shift. And that all starts again with addressing this as the health issue that it is. Um, again, as I shared, I live in Utah and we had a beautiful thing happen in our, in our, our faith. Um, the, the LDS Church came out just a few short weeks ago and said, we will no longer say suicide is a sin. We will no longer use that terminology. I cried <laughs> hard. I did the ugly cry in my car. But I was so grateful because, again, we know more today than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. And when we perpetuate those stigmas and those myths, they keep people from seeking help. They keep people from getting the help that they need. But on the same token, the other thing we need to be mindful of in this work as we move forward, we put a lot of burden on the suicidal individual. Remember, we're talking about a person that is desperate to escape unbearable pain, crisis point reach, thinking limited, and we say, reach out, reach out, reach out. Stay, stay, stay. Choose to stay, choose to stay, choose to stay. Again, if this is a health issue, that's like telling somebody with cancer, choose to live. <laughs> they want to live. They don't always have the tools and the, the treatment and the care needed to be able to do that. So, so I, I appreciate this conversation so much. I appreciate the willingness of each of you being here today and those that are watching to really elevate this conversation in a meaningful way. We have done great work. We have a long way to go. But implementing systems of care and providing better suicide safe care. You know how many no suicide contracts I signed in my life? A whole ton, okay? <laughs> I could have a stack of them. Um, I have a safety plan today. I use 
that safety plan today. When my brain goes back to those moments and it says I can't do it, I know it's lying to me. And I use that safety plan today. I tell somebody. I call my therapist. I get in. I, I take care of my mental health. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Because I decided 16 years ago I wasn't going to rest <laughs> until we stop suicide. I want this to no longer be the health issue of our time. But we do that by these conversations. We do that by taking note. And we do that by no longer creating awareness. We're aware suicide's a problem. We need to take action. We need to take action. Thank you so much for your time today.